again, as we highlighted, uh, we're working across uh, 30 nations and we do support from all different types of transactional support all the way into full component uh, PBLs across the board. Um, a large benefit of being able to do that is as we work with uh, industrial participation requirements or localization efforts, those types of things, a lot of that work really comes down to being what you do from the sustainment side. Certainly if they buy the aircraft off of a multi-year platform uh, where they've already got the suppliers and builders for that are largely taken care of, how do we go through and meet those expectations and those needs and work with the local industry? So a lot of that does come down to uh, the support and sustainment and training side. So we do have a number of entities, so we have specific uh, kind of business leads, Boeing Defense Australia, and we can talk about some of the things that they do for supporting not only Australian aircraft, but uh, a couple of other countries that are doing training there. Obviously we're here in the UK, so Boeing Defense UK, uh, long history with working Chinook Apache so support and sustainment. Uh, India, as you see the, the picture of the Apache there, uh, you know, India has been uh, significantly flying their Apaches. So they're flying about 40% more than a lot of other countries in the world getting those hours on. We've got a couple of pilots there that are three years flying the Apache, already have a thousand hours of flight time in it. So, and then Boeing Saudi Arabia and then Boeing Japan. So you can see the kind of some of the primary products that are each one of those entity countries to be able to work there. So, I know we're here to talk about uh, vertical lift. So we'll kind of go through and highlight uh, each of the platforms to a little extent, kind of give you what's going on with the program, uh, kind of talk through any of the questions and challenges that are happening with that. Most of you know that we, uh, we build the Chinook and our portion of V-22 Philadelphia, teamed with uh, Leonardo out of Philadelphia as well. They do the final work there. The interesting thing about Philadelphia is if you, there's a road that goes through the middle of it, one half of its congressional district is Democrat, one half of its congressional district is Republican, so you have to speak both with equal enthusiasm as you go through the work of politics and all that. So, so it makes it interesting. I know we have little things going on here in the UK for some of the political side as well, so and we'll go into that, but it always makes it fun. Um, we're also doing our portion of Defiant, working with, uh, with Lockheed Martin Sikorsky, obviously, in a couple of locations. We've had work done in Mesa. We've also had done work done in Philly. And then we build, obviously, the Apache and the A-6 uh, in Mesa, Arizona. So as you're well aware, most of our stuff, we do a lot of integration. So there's hundreds of suppliers that provide parts components that the final integration is done in those locations for talking to the, of the platforms. Um, so, in what's going on with Little Bird? You know, obviously, if we've got like, two international customers, you know, Saudi Arabia's been flying the A6 for a while. Uh, recent sale of eight aircraft to Thailand. So, if we're going to go through and look through the advantages of the A6, obviously, the quick reactions you're able to go through and quickly get the aircraft started gives you light attack. You'll be able to go through and then quickly defend support some of like oil fields any of the industrial complexes built up with those types of things, as well as uh, be able to do a scout reconnaissance mission, a lot of flights in an urban environment. Advantages are you've got a lot of the same cockpit configuration that's in the Apache. So we took a lot of the benefits for the targeting, the weapon systems, all the things that are beneficial from that to kind of have the crew station design, clear on board, all those types of things that give it as much commonality and capabilities and just similar to what the Apache is, but still keep it in the, the quick reaction light attack aircraft to be able to go through and do that. So it really is, you know, a great light attack reconnaissance aircraft used by a lot of special, uh, in a lot of special operations missions, things like that going on around the world. Um, you know, for the, for the OSPI, obviously, uh, there's over 480 of them out in the world, flown by the Marine Corps, the U.S. Navy, uh, the Air Force for Special Operations Missions, and then with Japan having the first international sale going on for that. You know, the speed and range of, uh, of the fixed wing aircraft, also being able to do hover operations, and go into you know, the configuration that the X hire can go through and do those types of missions and, and operations. So, um, working a lot to be able to get common, con consistent configuration through all the aircraft, really what that really benefits doing is how do you sustain the aircraft. So if you've got common systems, things that are going on for that to make all the configurations uh, be much more consistent with what they're going on to be. It's been doing great, um, well over 700,000 flight hours around the world flying <coughs> on V-22. Um, 
high operational readiness rates, it's really doing a, an excellent mission supporting our special operations forces as well as the C2 mission for uh, for the Navy being able to take cargo, mail, things out to the, the individual aircraft instead of just having a lot of the carrier and then use the rotorcraft to be able to do them to other platforms. So, uh, significant benefit for what's happening with the V-22. You know, for the Apache, um, long history of the Apache, we've been flying the Apache since 1984. Right now there are 17 countries around the world that are operating the platform. Um, we continue to upgrade and enhance the aircraft. So um, one of the advantages of, of a company like Boeing and the long-term existing platforms we have is we've got proven records of taking the base aircraft and then continually upgrading it, modernizing even get new and capabilities to keep it where it is relevant and be able to be an effective and affordable process to do that. And then the countries that continue to come in and see the advantages of the Apache, they want to be able to have not only the best attack helicopter in the world, but also be part of that community where if we can share parts, components, we can talk about tactics, techniques, training, all the things that they're doing, how they interoperate and work those together. Um, most of you are well familiar with the capabilities, fire control radar, 250, the ability to, to collect 256 targets very quickly. The advantage of that is you've got all the, the targets you can collect, but it can then, using the Link 16, be able to send out information to say, if I've got a four ship mission, these are the areas that you're going to be worried about, these are the areas you're worried about, and so you don't have that cross overlap of what you're looking at and keeping track of for the, for the targets and the threats that are out there. The system also kind of tells you, based on the weapons that you have on board, whether you use some or not, based on what you still have on the aircraft, here's your primary uh, threat and here's the, the systems that you should use to be able to engage uh, those threats. So uh, the real-time sensor to shooter timelines for multiple episodes, whether it be the, the Hellfire, whether it be the Rockets, whether it be the 30 millimeter, it's all designed in there to make it interoperable. Uh, quick response, quick reaction to what you're going to be doing to protect the aircraft, and more importantly, the ground crews or the other aircraft that are in your area that you're out going for the mission that you're working to support. So, uh, a lot of upgrades right now. There's upgrades going on to the fire control radar. There's upgrades going on to the, the daytime target systems to give you greater range, give you more of a color picture, and make it a much more user friendly how try to minimize the workload that the crews have to go through and do to be able to execute to those types of missions. So how do we use the system as much as possible to be able to, uh, to, to go through it and look at the multitude of things that have to go on in the aircraft so while you're flying it, while you're looking at what your targets are, what you're looking at what your threats are, and how you're integrating information back and forth with the, uh, with the, the folks on the ground. Obviously the aircraft's been out for a couple years, but the aircraft of today is not the same that came out in 1984 continuous modernization efforts. We've got teams working on what's next, what do we do for improvements for speed, power, payload, uh, altitude, firepower. All those things are continuing to be looked at on a continual basis. So, um, I can talk for about seven hours on this one, but I won't. <laughs> so unless you guys like the heat, we can go outside, put it in the tent, make sure you're really comfortable as we do the next seven hours on the charts here. So, uh, we've been flying the Chinook, and it's been the heavy lift helicopter of choice since 1961. So, obviously, again, what was built in 1961 and what's out there today, not the same. Looks the same for the outer bolt line, but all the materials for the airframe, for the blades, for the transmissions, the engines, all of that has been upgraded and modernized. All the cockpit systems for, you know, current capabilities, current technology to be able to make that work is, uh, is still there. But if you look at the types of missions that it performs. Uh, we know what threats we've been looking at, we know what we have to go through and try to do and achieve. So the types of missions that we're doing are applicable to a multitude of things. Sure, it has a, a combat mission where you're able to insert significant numbers of troops into uh, an area for any type of engagement they have. But you also do a multitude of other things. Well, for the troop insertion, they have seats for 33, I personally had 115 in the back. They weren't necessarily comfortable, but they were pretty happy to be leaving the area that I was taking them away from. Uh, we have done missions where we put upwards of 75, 80 combat equipped troops into a, a one inside at one point in time. 
But in addition to that, it does you know the search and rescue mission. So I've done search and rescue missions with it. Humanitarian service. If you've seen an actual disaster in the last 15, 20 years, you've probably seen a Chinook providing supplies, doing something for that mission to be able to go through and support them. Uh, we talked about nation building. If you're going to help build bridges, you're going to help build towers, you're going to be putting antennas up on certain things. Sometimes they're inaccessible to be able to get to. Chinook is a great way to go through and do that. We see a lot of our countries that are operating the aircraft. They use it for a multitude of things. I mean, I, I know my personally, I put an antenna up on the side of a mountain at Mount St. Helens. I've used it to be able to help with, uh, um, there was a, a wild animal issue that we were able to provide food and uh, medication types of stuff for the wild animals. So a multitude of things that you can go through and do with it. Plus, obviously, with the uh, internal cargo or external cargo, it gives you great flexibility to put the equipment that you need where you need it. Uh, and you get great stability from the aircraft, whether I'm in high altitudes, like the aircraft where the crew needs it, not where I as a pilot needs it, to be able to do a multitude of things as we go forward with it. You, know, you see the, the, the MH-47 from the bottom picture there. It's got the air refueling probe. Uh, obviously, we've been doing air refueling with the Chinook, whether it be a skinny tank, a uh, standard range tank, or an extended range tank, the larger ones, uh, for decades. So it is a proven technology proven capability to go through and do so. Again, we have a lot of our countries, that the number's increasing, uh, 20 operators right now. You get interoperability, you get to be part of that community, you get to be part of what the aircraft needs to go through and do uh, for, when you ask yourself, okay, we look for heavy lift helicopter, which one provides the most capability? Why are all these other countries choosing it? And what are we gonna be able to do for support and sustain the platform?